So hello everyone, my name is Sarah Isinga and I'm the manager of patient programs, research and advocacy here at Lymphoma Canada. And I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's conference session on diffuse large B cell lymphoma. We appreciate all those that are able to attend live today to learn more about the disease specific biology and diagnosis of this lymphoma subtype. This presentation will highlight novel research and treatment options that are accessible to lymphoma patients across Canada. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to provide you some guidance on the Zoom software for the session. This virtual software does not allow you to share your video or your microphone. If you do have a question, please save it for the aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma Q&A session following this presentation. And this is where you can ask your questions to the presenter live. I would now like to introduce and welcome you to our speaker, Dr. Mona Sheffe. Dr. Mona Sheffe is a clinical associate professor in the Division of Hematology and Hematological Malignancies um, and the Medical Director of the Alberta Blood and Bone Marrow Transplant Program. She completed her medical school and residency training at the University of Ottawa in 2008 and completed her fellowship training in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation at the University of Calgary in 2010. Her clinical and research Interests are in malignant hematology with the focus of management of patients with lymphoma and CLL, including the use of cellular therapies, including stem cell transplantation and CAR T cell therapies, all in the treatment of these diseases. We thank you very much for joining us today, and I'll turn the presentation over to you. Well, thanks for inviting me to be part of this um, uh, conference and uh, quite pleased to be talking about uh, this topic. So hopefully by the end of the talk, um, the audience will get a good understanding of how we diagnose, classify, stage, and prognosticate in patients who are diagnosed with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And then the focus of the talk will spend time on frontline treatment, uh, as well as in the instance of relapse. So hopefully covering the full gamut of uh, this disease. So when we talk about uh, lymphoma, lymphoma is actually quite common. It is the most common disease in adults um, after the big four, the breast, uh, colon, prostate, and lung cancer. Um, and as you can see on the graph on the right, we are seeing an uptick in the number of new cases uh, seen over the years. Uh, and so this is a, a problem that's not going to go away anytime soon. But the good news is, is we're getting better at our treatments. In fact, over the last 50 years, we have doubled our cure rates and survival rates. So this bodes well for the future with some of the new therapies that are coming down the pipeline. The fuse large B cell lymphoma is in fact the most common type of uh, lymphoma that's diagnosed accounting for 30% of all non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So what causes lymphoma? Well, lymphoma really is a cancer of the lymphocyte and the lymphocyte is a really important white blood cell in uh, the immune response. And naturally these uh, cells undergo um, what a process called hypermutation, a, a normal process in response to exposures such as infections. But sometimes these lymphocytes can make mistakes and uh, these mistakes can lead to different types of mutations. And that can lead to uh, an advantage for the cell uh, leading it to become cancerous. Advantages, things like um, uh, being able to grow faster and to live longer. And as such, because these mutations can occur anywhere along the pathway, you can actually get quite a few different types of lymphoma. So when we talk about lymphoma, we really, we're really we not talking about a one type of cancer. We're really talking about many different types um, that behave and respond differently to treatment. So even within the topic of diffuse RTB cell lymphoma, we can actually see the even subtypes of, of a subtype of lymphoma. So many patients ask about this, you know, why, why did I get my lymphoma? Well, the, the vast majority of patients um, don't have a reason. Uh, in fact, uh, we can't pinpoint any particular exposures or anything um, in their history that would point to as to why they develop lymphoma. The main reason really is, is a problem with the immune system, which as we get older, uh, doesn't um, take care of uh, mistakes or, or um, early cancer cells as, 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 um, we, as when we're younger. But there are some certain 
um, factors that do play into the lymphoma development. Uh, we do know things like um, HIV infection, hepatitis C can lead to certain types of lymphomas. There's even bacterial infections that can cause a lymphoma that you can, you can cure with antibiotics. Immune dysfunction, as I mentioned, is probably the biggest category and, and that's through no fault of the patient themselves. They are uh, stuck with a different disease, say rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and they, they're put on uh, um, immunosuppressant drugs to control that disease. And as a consequence, uh, they can develop lymphoma later. Uh, certainly we see a, a lot of this in the organ transplant population. These patients have to take uh, these drugs uh, in order to survive and unfortunately that um, uh, can, can lead to lymphoma. Uh, many patients ask about whether uh, having a family history or it, it, what's the chances of passing this on to their, their, their children. It's actually extremely uh, low uh, in the few large piece of lymphoma and maybe more common in some other types but definitely not a common thing that we see. So when we talk about diffuse large piece of lymphoma, uh, the table on the right uh, is meant really just to describe to you all the, all the subtypes or possibilities that diffuse large piece of lymphoma can re refer to. So some of these are treated exactly the same way, so it doesn't matter, but others have um, specific interventions or uh, other treatment plans that should be used um, uh, to target the, their, their specific type. And so we um, are very reliant on the, the pathology, the pathologist to tell us exactly what we're dealing with so that we know what the right strategy is for, for treatment. Um, even though it's an aggressive B-cell lymphoma, it, it, usually the, the word aggressive means it's actually more responsive to treatment. So the idea of being able to cure uh, uh, the lymphoma with uh, chemotherapy treatment and or radiation is, uh, is possible. And we're, we're successful the majority of the times regardless of how um, uh, they present. So most patients will tell you how they have, how their lymphoma developed. They present with enlarged glands or lymph nodes, um, usually in areas in the body that they can feel. So the neck, uh, the armpits, the groin, um, and they're, they usually tell you stories that they're, they're growing very rapidly. So over a period of weeks or months. Um, and in some cases, if they develop in, in uh, important areas, they can become life-threatening. So the example I'm showing you here is a, is a, a chest x-ray, uh, which is abnormal. A person who presented with chest pain and shortness of breath and is found to have a very large growing chest mass that's causing the symptoms. And so those are the, the typical things that we see. Um, but sometimes the... the um, Lymphoma is outside of the lymph nodes, and then patients can present with, with many different uh, symptoms. Uh, so uh, if they have um, a change in their neurological status, they become confused, or they may even present like a stroke with weakness on one side of the body, that could mean they have brain involvement of their uh, lymphoma. So essentially with, with this type of lymphoma, this large cell lymphoma, any particular body part can be affected and I think I've seen the whole gamut in my career. The diagnosis is made with the tissue biopsy. This is really important. Um, and often the reason why uh, things are delayed in terms of getting a diagnosis, because if you do a, a small biopsy where you get a, a small piece of tissue, you may be able to say, yep, the patient has lymphoma. But as I mentioned, there's so many different kinds we need more tissue to tell us exactly what type so that we, we, we treat you the right way. So we like to get a good chunk uh, of cells. Um, most often, if we can feel the lymph node ourselves, then we'll have the surgeon take out the lymph node. If it's deeper or it's dangerous to take out the lymph node, then we'll do uh, what's called a core biopsy. And essentially, the pathologist can take one look at this, describe the cells in a diffuse large piece of lymphoma. These are large cells that are, that are replacing normal tissue. And then we do specific testing uh, to confirm uh, the subtype and also prognosticate because there's certain markers like the CMYK mutation, which I'll talk about later, uh, CD20, which is a marker that tells us this patient will resp respond to a drug called the tuximab. Those are the things that we're looking for on that pathology specimen. So when you get the pathology report, there's lots of things uh, written on there, and, and that's to guide the clinician as to um, uh, what treatment approach they should uh, proceed with. Uh, something called germinal center B-cell type large cell lymphoma is um, uh, usually noted 
Um, and this is based um, on uh, two ways of testing. One is a molecular testing, which is really more of a research thing. Um, we don't have that uh, available in clinical practice here in Canada. But the molecular testing uh, was the first test that kind of um, subdivided patients into these categories, germinal center B cell type or GCB versus the non-GCB. And the non-GCB patients tended to have more disease and they tended to respond less to standard treatment. So this is a group we wanted to target with different therapies. In practice, we don't use the molecular testing. Uh, we use um, special staining of the samples and that kind of gives us a best guess as to what type of uh, lymphoma these, the patient is categorized in. And then at the end of the day, the pathologist will tell us. Uh, other testings that we do, so after we've established that this is a large cell lymphoma, just based on the pictures and the staining, we want to know other prognostic markers. And I think the most important one is something called the CMYC or CMYC. It is a gene that when it's mutated, gets turned on. Um, and then this leads to the cells, the tumor cells proliferating, surviving, being more resistant to treatment and behaving much more aggressively. And then when that gene is affected, plus other genes, in particular, uh, an oncogene called BCL2, which makes it uh, resistant to cell death, you have uh, uh, the worst combination. You have uh, one gene that turns the cell on to proliferate and, and grow, and then you have another gene that prevents it from dying. And so this, this combination is a bad combination, but we like to look for it. Thankfully, it's just only seen in less than 10% of the fused large species lymphoma, but um, uh, we do look for it and we, we give it its own category. Sometimes it's called high-grade B cell lymphoma, sometimes it's called double hit lymphoma. There's something in between called a, um, a double expressor lymphoma where um, we can't identify these genes by um, mutations through a testing called FISH, but we may see it uh, by a staining of the pathology slides. And this particular lymphoma, this diffuse, um, this double expressor lymphoma, is kind of in the middle between garden variety large cell and these double hits. <clears throat> and so the, what I'm trying, trying to show you here is why, why the NIC testing is important. Uh, it's because if you have it, if that's part of your lymphoma diagnosis, we know you're not going to do as well with standard uh, treatment. And this is something we need to watch for uh, and monitor more closely for the possibility of relapse or even do other inter interventions um, to try to mitigate that risk, particularly if you have more aggressive disease or more advanced stage disease. So routinely in all centers, if you're uh, diagnosed with large cell lymphoma, your center should be looking for this particular mutation as the next step. So at the end of the day, we end up dividing the fused large piece of lymphoma into the, these categories. So you have your GCB subtype, you have your non-GCB subtype, and then you have your high-grade B-cell lymphoma or double hits, as well as the um, double expressor lymphomas. So once the pathologist has confirmed you have the few large B-cell lymphoma, you want to know well, what your stage is. Um, and so do we as, as, as the person that's treating you. And so the most common testing that we use for staging where it's available is uh, the PET scan. Uh, the difference between a PET scan is a, and a CT scan, a CT scan gives you a picture. It tells you uh, where um, things are abnormal especially, uh, and gives you the sizes of lymph nodes, which is important, um, but it's not as good at finding um, uh, disease outside of the lymph nodes. And a PET scan is much more sensitive to that. So the PET scan can pick up even small levels of disease in other organs, and in particular, your bone marrow. So if you get a PET scan and your bone marrow is not active, then you, wouldn't, you really don't need to do a bone marrow test to, to look for. We used to do CT scans plus bone marrows in all patients, but now with the PET scan, we can omit that. So uh, the only time I, I, I actually do any bone marrow biopsies anymore is if uh, we think, well, uh, that's the source of the lymphoma in the first place, the patient doesn't have any lymph nodes to biopsy. Um, or I can't get a PET scan in a fast fashion. So we have a waiting list for PET scans, usually three to four weeks. And if I have a patient in front of me who has um, um, 
uh, a lot of symptoms related to the lymphoma and they can't wait four weeks for the PET scan, then I might talk them into doing a bone marrow biopsy to complete the staging. And this is what we use for staging. And it's really based on where the lymphoma is located. So if it's really just in one site, like one side of the neck, um, that would be considered a stage one. If it's uh, both sides of the neck or the neck and an armpit, uh, but uh, all on one side of the diaphragm, that is considered stage two. Stage three is lymph nodes. Uh, involved on um, above and below the diaphragm. So in this example, here is the neck and the groin area. And then stage four is when you have a, a disease outside of the lymph nodes. And in this case, they're demonstrating the liver here, as well as the bone. And then finally, when we talk about prognosis, we look at a few factors um, that patients uh, present with that decide how well the patient is going to do with standard treatment. Uh, these are very simple biochemical markers, um, lab tests, in, in addition to uh, knowing what the patient's stage is. So if you're older than 60, if you have a, um, a marker called LDH in your blood that's elevated, performance status is how well you're doing um, with this lymphoma. So we use the ECOG performance scale. And if you're completely well with very minimal symptoms, you're up and about and you're still working, you're considered a zero. Uh, if you had to stop working or you're barely uh, getting yourself to clinic or need assistance, even with um, some of your activities of daily living, we're talking ECOG 2. Um, if you're bed bound, uh, you're more ECOG 3 or ECOG 4. And the, 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 the more symptoms you have related to the lymphoma, the poor the, your prognosis is with respect to treatment. And then lastly, if it, whether or not the, the disease is outside of the lymph nodes, we think that's important too. So we just plug all these numbers together. And then at the end, at end um, we decide whether you're considered low risk or intermediate risk or high risk. Uh, uh, if you're in the low risk category, these are usually patients with limited stage disease who are doing well um, and uh, will do very, very well with standard treatment. We're talking cure rates of 85 to 90%. Whereas if you're in the middle or you're uh, having uh, older, uh, older age with advanced stage disease, you're automatically in the poor risk uh, category. And then our chances of cure are less so. Still around 50%, uh, but it is, those are the patients we tend to worry about more. We want to be more aggressive with respect to monitoring um, and switching gears if things aren't working. So switching to treatment, <clears throat> The standard treatment for large cell lymphoma is chemoimmunotherapy. Um, and that hasn't changed really for uh, decades. Uh, in fact, it used to be CHOP alone that was the standard for large cell lymphoma until 2006 when rituximab was added to the CHOP. And then whether or not you get four cycles or six cycles or how many cycles the, the physician wants really depends on your stage and whether or not you're gonna be giving, getting radiation therapy as well as um, chemotherapy. And if you take all comers who receive this RCHOP chemotherapy, uh, we're, we're able to cure about 60% of patients. Now RCHOP is not an easy chemotherapy treatment to go through. Um, it's considered an aggressive treatment and has all the things that most people associate uh, chemotherapy with. So it's, it's the treatment that's gonna make you feel tired. It's gonna make you feel nauseous. It's gonna cause constipation. It's going to make you lose your hair and it's, we will, it will make you immunosuppressed. Um, so these patients are uh, highly immunocompromised and are high risk for infections, both in the short term, but even month, many months after finishing treatment. And there are some other long-term effects from treatment as well. So it can, it can damage your heart and it can damage your nerves and cause some, something called peripheral neuropathy. So it's not taken lightly and not everybody is fit for the treatment, but we do try to push it. So even if I have a, a person as old as 80, um, if there are, they were a high functioning 80 year old who before the lymphoma was, was doing a, a, a well, living on their own and, and um, living a, an essentially normal life, then I would, I would have a serious talk with them about this treatment, you know, pros and cons of pursuing it, because it really works well to treat this lymphoma. Um, 
So when it, when it comes to limited stage disease, um, these are generally good prognosis uh, lymphomas. So uh, stage one or stage two. Um, and uh, our goal is to try to give the amount of treatment you need without over treating. So the idea is to give uh, minimal amounts of chemotherapy to avoid some of the long-term effects from chemo, particularly heart uh, uh, disease and cardiomyopathies. Um, and it may include the use of radiation treatment because if it is localized and you don't need to target, say, uh, a spot in the neck, then, the, then that's easier than somebody who has lymphoma everywhere. You can't really use radiation. So this, this is um, um, a good prognosis uh, uh, disease. Um, most patients do well. I've had the occasional patient, though, that has had a, a, a late uh, relapse. Um, so it can happen even years after uh, you've uh, received treatment. For advanced stage disease, it's pretty straightforward. We just give our CHOP chemotherapy and we give six cycles of that. Um, they've done studies looking at giving more treatment, uh, up to eight cycles, and that doesn't seem to make a difference with respect to outcomes, um, reducing the risk of relapse, for example, but it does uh, have a higher risk of toxicities. So we've opted to, to stick with the six cycles for a while. On occasion, um, patients even after the six cycles of treatment, if they still have a, a spot uh, lighting up on the PET scan that we use to restage them, then we may, may consider radiation treatment. And if you take all comers for patients who have stage three or stage four disease, uh, most of them are still going to be alive after treatment uh, with cure rates between 55 and 65%. So, I mean, 55 to 65% is not bad, but we always have, want to improve things. Uh, I think that one of the things uh, we want to see is more patients cured with their first treatment instead of having to rely on therapies um, later on. So this, this, this has been ongoing for the last 15 years. With, any, with every new development that we have, we test it in patients with the Fusarch B lymphoma, whether that's, um, changing the frequency. So we normally give the treatment every three weeks. Um, they tried doing it every two weeks to see if that made a difference, but it didn't. Uh, changing the antibody. So rituximab is a great antibody for uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Abinutuzumab is a newer one, a more potent one that's been studied. Um, and at our center, we participated in the trial, the Goya trial, but it made no difference. Um, what about more intensive regimens? Some, some patients with large cell lymphoma are treated with a, a combination called dose-adjusted EPOC-R. Uh, well, they did a trial looking at that for all patients with large cell lymphoma, and it made no difference. Mm. Uh, what about some new drugs? Abrutinib and lenalidomide are newer therapies. Oral drugs the patients are taking now for lymphomas. Neither one of them have, have panned out either. But more recently, a newer treatment called polituzumab, bedotin, is, is really the first treatment in the last 15 years that seems to have shown a difference. People who received the polituzumab did better than uh, those who received the RCHOP. Now, you might not think that 6.5% is a big difference, um, but it is, it is to the patient, <laughs> you know, the, those patients that um, stay in remission. So the, the um, question that's being posed to us is which patient should be getting it. Because if, if we tried to give every patient with large cell lymphoma polituzumab, it would bankrupt the system. It's a quite expensive therapy. So um, our big task right now is trying to decide which patients, who are the highest risk patients, patients who are not going to get cured with RCHOP, maybe they should get this um, uh, polituzumab uh, uh, as an alternative. So I, I want to spend a, a minute or two talking about double hit lymphoma uh, because it is uh, approached different than uh, most patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And as I mentioned, this has to do with the presence of that mutation, that CMIC mutation with a partner gene. Most commonly this BCL2, sometimes another gene called BCL6. These patients tend to have more disease. They, they tend to have very fast growing lymphomas. Um, more advanced stage disease, more a disease outside of the lymph nodes, the elevated LDH, that marker of cell turnover I was mentioning, and a poor prognosis based on the IPI. So if we, we took patients who received our CHOP, if you look at the curve on the right, 
if they don't have these mutations, they do very well. So the, that's the, the blue curve, the top curve on, the, uh, on there, where if you have um, one, or, um, uh, one of the mutations, you're in that yellow kind of middle ground. But if you're in the gray, the gray zone, the double hits, you, you can see that your survival, your average survival is, is going to be less than three years. <clears throat> so these are the patients we need to target with better treatments because our CHOP isn't going to be enough. So I know this is a busy slide, but really at the end of the day, what I wanted to say is that um, we have tried other regimens. So lots of different regimens um, that are much more intense for these double hit lymphomas. Um, mo the most commonly one we use nowadays is called this dose adjusted EPOC R. It seems to do better than our CHOP for um, uh, double hit lymphoma. Um, I did mention the, the phase three trial where they compared the two for all comers of the fusarge piece lymphoma, there was no difference, but it does appear that in that subset of patients who received, uh, who had the double hit entity, the dose adjusted epoch R seems to do a little bit better. So when we uh, met as a group um, across Canada to decide, you know, what would be our recommendation for this particular entity, we decided that uh, for these double hit or triple hit lymphomas, we would go with dose adjusted epoch R. And the difference between the dose adjusted epoch R and the R CHOP treatment is that the, the um, dose adjusted epoch R is a lot more intense. Um, it actually often requires hospitalization to get the treatment given uh, over four days. And it's adjusted, that's where the, the dose adjust comes on, um, where the doses are increased depending on. Um, the, the patient's tolerance. So if their blood counts don't drop as low, then we push the dose a little bit. Um, it does make it a little bit more toxic and a lot more side effects associated with it, especially neuropathy, but it does seem to work uh, better. Uh, um, I work in Calgary and we actually have a different approach to uh, double hit lymphoma. Um, and so instead of do is using dose adjusted EPOC R, we still start with the R CHOP, but then we, we still intensify the treatment using a stem cell transplant, where we use the patient's own stem cells to help rescue them from high dose chemo. And with that, we're able to cure a, a significant proportion of these patients much better than, than we would have with R CHOP alone. And since we've been doing this for years, we've never made the switch to dose adjusted EPOC R because we didn't think that it, it um, uh, was a, uh, a big advantage. There's no study to tell us this though. There's been no study comparing dose-adjusted EPOC R or transplant. So I think both strategies are certainly reasonable. I think at the end of the day, you wanna do everything you can possible to cure your, your lymphoma uh, with the, the first chance that you get. And I'll briefly mention this entity, this double expressor lymphoma. It's, as I said, it's kind of in the middle between a double hit and uh, the regular diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And we really don't know what to do with this entity. Um, uh, we, it's thankfully not common, but we do know that um, our CHOP doesn't work as well. And we don't know if the other regimens like those adjusted EPOC R or um, uh, even a stem cell transplant works better in this uh, disease entity. So I think this is still an area of what we call unmet need, a group of patients that um, it's more of a case-by-case -case decision as to what treatment regimen we go to. So in my practice, if, if the patient in front of me is um, a younger, fitter patient who has very aggressive disease, advanced stage, high IPI, this would be a patient that I would uh, talk into doing something like a stem cell transplant. And again, in order to try to improve the cure rates. So this is our treatment algorithm. Um, as I mentioned, the staging isn't going to be important as well as this uh, uh, testing for the CMIC. And once we have those two factors, we can tell you exactly which route you should go to. Um, the vast majority of patients are gonna receive RCHOP chemotherapy. Um, limited stage patients may also get radiation. And it's really that small proportion uh, of patients who are MIC positive uh, with their double hit who are gonna get the dose adjusted EPOC R. Uh, 
Now moving on to relapsed refractory disease. So unfortunately, this is still a common problem. Um, so a third of patients are going to relapse and that means they have uh, achieved the remission the first time around and then either a new lesion or recurrence of the same lesion they had before uh, happens after the co complete response has been established. And it can happen anytime. In most cases, it happens in the first two years, but there are late relapses uh, that have been uh, reported. The, my record is unfortunate 11 years, uh, a young man who had his lymphoma come back 11 years after his initial treatment. Um, refractory disease is even worse. So we're talking about 10% of patients and these patients have never responded to their lymphoma. And what I mean by that is they got their initial treatment, but the lymphoma never went away. Um, and, or if it went away, it went away for a really short period of time. So we're talking three months or less. So by definition, that really isn't disappearing if it comes back that quickly. So, it, you know, for us, after a patient has been treated, that's the most um, anxiety provoking time for the patient. They, they have this in the back of their head that, that the lymphoma can come back, is that can happen. And so they're worried about it. And the way to um, kind of relieve that worry is to continue to monitor them. And you monitor them with clinical visits. So I ask them to come back to see me every three months, usually in the first year, every six months the next year. Um, uh, I do physical examinations. And the patients are good about telling me if something's up. If, so if they think there's a new lymph node or a new lump or something that they're worried about, then that would prompt us to do some investigations. They did uh, a study are looking at surveillance scans um, and you would have to do 454 scans to pick up a relapse that the patient didn't have any symptoms for. And that's a lot of scans to, pre to prevent one um, relapse. Uh, and so you don't really need to do that. And it's a, it's a, um, a waste of resources for, for the rest of the patients that need them. Um, and, and it's not good patient care because patients will relapse in between the scans. And, and I just do them if there's any symptoms. And that seems to work out really well. It doesn't uh, seem to affect their prognosis or response to their next line of therapy. So that's really important to reassure patients that it's okay that we're not monitoring this way. So um, when we think about our options for treatment, um, the, the first things that, that come to mind are more the intensive treatment options, things like um, stem cell transplant or CAR T cell therapy. And, and, and this is because those options um, basically give you a second kick at the can in terms of curing uh, patients uh, from their lymphoma. And uh, they've been this, this stem cell transplant in particular has been the standard of care for nearly two decades where repeat chemotherapy was compared to giving chemo and a transplant and those who got a transplant did much better. So we're usually able to um, uh, uh, be successful in about half of patients that are referred for stem cell transplant. But these only, that only works if the patient has chemosensitive disease because that's how a stem cell transplant works. And I'll talk about that in a sec. CAR T cell therapy though is used for the patients who um, aren't chemosensitive, the really poor prognosis refractory uh, patient um, or patients who have relapsed um, um, after even a stem cell transplant. And that option is now uh, available in Canada um, in uh, three provinces, uh, in Alberta, Ontario and Quebec. And uh, for those who are outside those provinces, uh, usually they're referred to one of those centers or uh, in the past, they've been referred uh, to the US for uh, therapy. If you're not a candidate for cellular therapy for whatever reason, um, there are uh, other treatment options available, but these are certainly limited. And um, our, my approach in that situation is more um, symptom relief, management of lymphoma, quality of life, trying to keep patients' disease under control for as long as possible, but knowing that the patient is likely going to succumb from the lymphoma uh, at some point in the future. So there are other options. If you know if the disease is uh, limited stage, you can do radiation treatment, 
You could consider giving chemotherapy, but chemotherapy has a lot of side effects. Uh, even uh, uh, in multiple relapsed younger patients, they have to decide whether or not it's worthwhile going through treatment that we know isn't going to cure them. And then there's obviously clinical trials. I think that's a really important um, uh, option for patients who can get access to these. Uh, always ask your physician if that's a possibility if you're faced with uh, a relapse of your lymphoma. So this is our approach. If you are um, uh, suspected of having a relapse, the first thing I do is a CT scan, sometimes a PET scan. Um, if there was a remote time between the diagnosis and treatment and presentation of relapse, then I would want to get another biopsy. I think this is really important because sometimes you're surprised and the patients have different lymphomas. So um, the patient uh, could have an indolent lymphoma, like follicular lymphoma, and then the treatment options are different. Uh, I, I, I still prognosticate. So if the patient has a relapse disease, I, I still do the IPI to kind of see where, where they're at and what my expectations are with the next treatment. And then most importantly, trying to decide whether it's worthwhile referring the patient to a specialized cellular therapy program, because these are not available in every center. Um, and uh, if you're from uh, a town or city that's outside of a, a major academic center, you'll have to travel to these places to get this type of therapy. So when it comes to stem cell transplant, what we're talking about is an autologous stem cell transplant. So this is where we're using the patient's own stem cells to help rescue them from treatment. Um, really what we're using is the chemo, high dose chemotherapy to cure the lymphoma, and the stem cells are just meant to help you recover from that. And as I mentioned, we've been doing this regularly since 1995. Um, and uh, uh, um, I, think, I think all patients should be considered for it. I don't, I, we don't really have a, a true um, cutoff by age, uh, but we have some fitness criteria that we use uh, to make sure the patients can tolerate treatment, both organ function as well as a frailty assessment. Mm -hmm. But the key point here is that uh, it, it, this treatment only works if we give you a salvage chemo and that salvage chemo shows that the tumor is shrinking. If the tumor doesn't respond to salvage chemo, then stem cell transplant is not an option and we gotta do something else. Mm. So what about the refractory patient? A patient who either doesn't respond to chemo or salvage chemo, and that means they can't get a stem cell transplant or the patients who's relapsed after a transplant. And if you relapse less than a year after a transplant, your outcomes are, are quite poor. So if you look at the curve on the, on the right there, there's a significant drop in survival in that first year. So we're talking less than 20% of people are gonna be alive still with their lymphoma at two years. Um, and that's what we were working with before we had CAR-T cell therapy. So the average patient, patient who was in this category lived for about six months. Um, it's one of the most devastating things to tell a patient um, if they failed or can't get a stem cell transplant uh, because nothing we had really was helpful. <laughs> but this has changed in the last few years. Um, uh, if you've um, been watching the news and, and uh, you must have heard stories about um, CAR T cells, um, really, it's a really fascinating use of the immune system to treat your cancer. So essentially what we do is we take your own immune cells, your T cells, we take them to the lab, we modify them so that they can target the cancer cell using a specific target uh, in, in lymphoma, it's called CD19. And we basically make them a souped up immune fighters um, and we give them back to the patient. And, and we do that, um, those, those cells find cancer and then they try, they um, uh, basically uh, turn on the immune system. So it isn't just those cars, that are killing the cancer, but the rest of the immune system is recruited to get rid of the tumor. It's a really cool technology and works very well, even in patients who um, have had very refractory disease. And so these are the outcomes. So the, the orange curve was the baseline curve where I mentioned your, your, um, uh, the average survival is about six months. And the blue curve, the top curve, is for patients who were treated with um, this new therapy, the CAR T cell therapy. In this example, it's the 
axicaptogene cellulose or axicel for short. Um, and because of the dramatic response to this treatment and the fact that patients even after the treatment didn't relapse, so the potential for cure led to the approval in the US first and then in Canada uh, for the indication and relapse refractory large cell lymphoma. And this is just showing you the long-term uh, uh, follow-up. So in pa patients who achieve a complete remission, and usually you can establish that within the first three to six months after the treatment, those patients are staying in remission for a very long period of time. We're seeing this, uh, the, the top green curve is where you see this flattening of that curve, meaning patients who make it out beyond a year, they're staying in remission. And that's the experience that we're seeing in Alberta as well, that if you make it to the year, we're not seeing any uh, long-term relapses. So it's hard to call it a cure if, uh, without having many, many years behind you. But, but in this case, for those patients um, who aren't relapsing a year or later, that's a huge um, benefit. And I'm just showing you this picture because this is one of my patients I had to send to the US. Uh, on the left scan on side, this is her in May of 2020. Um, the, this is a PET scan. So what you're seeing, the dark areas is, is where, this, where the activity is um, high in the lymphoma. So if you look at just underneath her head, she's got some spots in her neck um, and she's got some spots in, her, in the, her chest area, as well as uh, in and around the uh, kidneys. And then you look at the scan on the right, which was done you know, just 30 days later and all those spots have disappeared. So she, she achieved a very quick, complete remission and a lady who never responded to any therapy had given her before, had failed at least two and I couldn't do the stem cell transplant because of that. And she is now more than two years after CAR-T and still in remission today. So what are the downsides of CAR-T cell therapy? Um, well, there are some toxicities associated with it. So that's why it needs to be administered in a specialized center. Uh, the biggest things that we look for are something called cytokine release syndrome, uh, which uh, can be things like fever, fatigue, almost like a um, uh, uh, flu-like illness. <clears throat> but if it can get uh, really ramped up, it can start to affect the organs like the heart and lungs and even the kidneys. The other thing that we look for is neurotoxicity. We don't understand the mechanism of why patients go funny after this treatment, but, but things like um, word finding difficulties uh, or even seizure activity or, or loss of motor function can occur in some severe cases, but it, but it all resolves. So that's the beauty of this. Even though you might have these side effects with um, treatment, uh, these patients have a complete resolution of the symptoms uh, and uh, usually be able to discharge uh, from hospital within seven to 10 days. The other more notable toxicity is the fact that it affects the B cells um, because it's a, it's a, the target we're using is, is for a, a normal B cell as well as the cancer B cell. So what happens is these patients lose the ability to make antibodies. And when you don't make antibodies, you can't fight infections, you can't mount response to vaccination. And uh, our biggest problem we had over the last couple of years has been, in fact, COVID, uh, because these patients can't respond to vaccines, and so they're not protected at all. Uh, and we've had we've actually lost a few CAR T patients because of COVID. Uh, I think I will skip this. Um, so if you can't have CAR T therapy or a stem cell transplant for whatever reason, then most commonly. The, the, the biggest reasons are um, lack of access, that you can't, you can't commit to traveling to a center, in a special ed center, or you want to have care closer to home. You'd rather be closer to your own um, center uh, for treatment uh, and want to have other therapies given to you that way. So as I mentioned, this polituzumab that's been studied in the frontline setting, well, it's actually approved uh, for um, patients with relapse refractory disease. Uh, so if you're in that category where you can't get a stem cell transplant or, or CAR T therapy, you can receive this treatment. And it, it does seem to provide some benefit um, uh, for those patients. It's not a home run, but it certainly will improve your quality of life for a period of time. Um, and uh, the hope is that um, 
uh, with the earlier use, we're gonna see less, less patients requiring it in, in second or third line treatment. Um, and then of course, there's gonna be other potential options uh, that could be tried if this isn't uh, uh, successful. But it's not curative for sure. These patients will relapse at some point and succumb to the lymphoma. So we, we tried different things, other chemotherapy regimens that you might've heard about. GDP is IV treatment. Uh, Pepsi is all oral treatments. Uh, that, that's my go-to for the uh, older unfit uh, patient who doesn't wanna come to the clinic for IV treatments. And I've used that successfully a few times. Uh, radiation um, for uh, patients with localized disease or, or a particularly troublesome lymph node. And of course, supportive care. So getting um, the pain and symptom management team, the palliative care team early to kind of help them support, support them with their symptoms and the transition to hospice care when, uh, if and when they need it. Uh, and so this is my plug for clinical trials. There's lots of new promising treatments that um, are not available um, uh, unless you do it through a clinical trial. Um, and there's lots of advantages. So it, it isn't just access to new treatments, but you, you get a lot of monitoring, get a lot of advice and care by the research team. And um, you might be the first patient to benefit from such a new method. And so this is a reason why we, we want to encourage patients to participate if and when they can. So in summary, uh, if you have relapsed um, uh, or refractory disease after frontline treatment, the biggest decision is whether or not uh, you're fit for intensive treatment. If you are, then you're assessed for the eligibility for stem cell transplant um, and you receive salvage chemo. If you respond to that, then you go on to the transplant. If you don't, then you go on to CAR T cell therapy. And if you aren't fit for intensive treatment, uh, well, as I mentioned, there's some palliative uh, chemotherapy options you can try or the clinical trials with some of these novel therapies. So in summary, uh, the fuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common aggressive B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It responds really well to standard treatment, even in patients with advanced stage disease. Uh, there is going to be a proportion of patients that relapse or even have refractory disease, but cure can and still is possible even in those patients with some of the treatments we have available. And there are a lot of new strategies uh, on the horizon to improve the outcomes in future patients. So um, uh, always ask for that and, and, and see what's, what's next in line for you if you're in those situations. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Shafee, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we appreciate your thorough review of diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, um, detailing their diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment options available for Canadians. Um, I would now like to um, direct our audience to attend the live Q&A session after this presentation to have your answers questions. Thank you.